I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where we say, why do a triple axel when you can think about one? You could watch someone do a triple axel. Exactly. So if you want to do it yourself, hey, go read a book. (laughs) But that's a lot harder than jumping up in the air and spinning three times and landing on one foot with heavy, heavy skates on. Yeah. But if you want to just think about it, watch it on YouTube. This is that YouTube my voice. <laughs> okay, we're reading books so you don't have to. Claire, yeah. what do we got going on? You guys, we have so many shows coming up. This is like our last run of shows for a bit. Tickets will be on our Instagram stories and linked in our bio and on Google. They're everywhere you would think normally on the internet to look for tickets. Our website, celebritymemoirbookclub.biz. Because we're businesses. <laughs> Ashley, okay, I'm switching it up, so watch yeah. out. What story from your week would make it into your memoir? Oh, wow. I think I'm switching it up because I feel that over the past three years of doing this godforsaken podcast, when we draw it out and make it thematic, I think we tend to hit on the same theme. So anything this week happened to you? Okay, do you know what, actually? Okay, not to get thematic, but I <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to, in the spirit of Gina Davis, get better at like processing thoughts as they're happening instead of later down the line being like, okay, well, I should have handled that conversation different. This weekend, I went to a street safety meeting with my street safety friends that I've made in the neighborhood. I need to place an order for a bike helmet ASAP. Biking weather is upon us. Yeah, no, you got to get one. Maybe we could go to a store and get fitted for proper mitts. Helm. There's a biking store around the corner from me in Bud's Me too. Well, maybe we'll go to rival biking stores and get fitted. (laughs) And then what we should do, we should hit our heads together like rams and see see which helmet holds up. Great idea. Stay tuned. This will be paywall content. (laughs) Watch Claire and Ashley give each other CTE for no reason. (laughs) Anyway, so I was at this street safety meeting having the time of my life. I even ran into like other friends who were there for a birthday party. And I was like, oh, my God, so many people I love in this room celebrating bike lanes and birthdays. Two of our favorite B words. Literally. Us bitches love bike lanes and B-Day parties. Anyway, and then on my way home, I saw this girl that I haven't seen in years. And she was like, oh, what are you up to? And I was like, on my way home from the street safety meeting. And so there's this rival thing. (laughs) There's There's uh, there's like rivals of street safety. (laughs) So there's this thing called Make McGinnis Safe, which is what the side I'm on, which involves putting bike lanes on McGinnis Boulevard. But there's this rival faction. Because a lot of people constantly die. Yeah. There's this rival faction called Keep McGinnis Moving, which believes that if you were to take out a lane of traffic and put in safety for bicyclists, then all of a sudden there would be so much traffic, the neighborhood would explode. (laughs) (laughs) Trucks would not be able to live. There are literal signs in the neighborhood that say trucks need routes, period. Can you imagine like standing up strong for trucks and being like, who will be the voice of the truck? Not even truck drivers. No, the trucks. Like truck corporations to be like, think of the profits. Like their big thing is that there is no way to get from Brooklyn to Queens without getting off the BQE, a.k.a. the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, which goes from Brooklyn to Queens and taking a shortcut through Greenpoint. That's the belief here is that they must cut through. And I'm like, no, they could take the long way on the motherfucking highway. Take the highway. Don't get off the highway. The long way also adds like one to two miles. (laughs) So anyway, so I'm walking. I run into her. She's like, what are you up to? And I was like, I'm on my way home from street safety. And she goes, oh, we're keep McGinnis moving. And I just kind of was like, ha ha. And then she talked to me like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Like, I haven't been to dozens of street safety meetings, actually three, but still. (laughs) And she she was like, well, you know, the young people who just moved to this neighborhood don't really understand the implications of make Megan it safe. I was like, not killing cyclists. Is that the implication of which you speak? And then she's like, whatever, you can go to your meetings, but don't sign anything. And I was like, ha ha, bye. And we just like kept walking. You are 32 years old. For her just to see you on the street and think she can tell you what you should and shouldn't be signing. When clearly you are informed. When clearly I'm informed. Clearly I don't believe in motor vehicles. I'm sorry. (laughs) Boeing has gone to shit. Cars are mean. Like, what do you (laughs) talk? Why would I vote for them? (laughs) So anyway, the thing that I would change about my week is I would lecture this lady. I would say, listen up. (laughs) If you don't respect bikes, keep bikes moving.com, then you can shove it up your bum. <laughs> Hell yeah. Claire, if you were to tell a story from your week, what would it be in the memoir? Okay, so last night me and Ashley went to a concert because one of my goals for this year was to go to like more events and like see more live stuff. 
as a lifelong not lover of music, I have ironically <laughs> found out that I actually love live music. It's so true. Something weird about me is I cannot stand listening to a song I've never heard before, which makes it tricky to learn new music. <laughs> I just have to wait for it to slowly seep into my system by going into CVS enough that it like it just all of a sudden the new Ariana Grande is in my head already and then I can listen to it. But I don't like music I haven't heard before. <laughs> totally. But I love going to a concert of somebody I don't know. I, it turns, I went to Chapel Rowan without having ever heard that bitch in my Dude, life. That was and it was a transformative experience. When I think back on it, I am like that was one of the best concerts I've been to in my life. Yeah, I mean, that was insane. I will say I randomly go to the concerts of bands I've never heard of, and they end up being so phenomenal. I went to this band called The Suffers, which is out of oh, you love them now, Houston, and they were so phenomenal that I was you, like, like follow them on the road like a deadhead now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like weeping and being like, live music is transformative. And then I will say I went to like a different live music, and I was like, oh no, no, no that just randomly that was a great band. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just that was like pure coincidence. But I have been trying to like do new things. And so I've been looking back at my repertoire and I'm like, well, what have I liked since seventh grade? I used to listen to music in middle school. Who was I then? And I liked the kooks and yeah. I saw that they were coming to Brooklyn. And so I said, Ashley, do you want to go to see the kooks with me? So we went to Brooklyn Steel last night to watch the kooks and we're there at 9 p.m. And I am there as a lover of live music who has no shame in that I mostly know four or five kooks songs. I know whatever is like their top five on Spotify, but I love them. So I don't know why I wouldn't like others. Anyway, so there I am listening to this band. They come out. They're so much more handsome than I predicted in my head. I was like, those are good looking boys. Ashley, you should be dating one of those boys. They looked so cute. They were out and they were doing songs. And I was like, huh, I don't know any of these songs. But it turns out the songs I don't know are even better than the songs I do know. And I'm sitting there being like, just as I predicted, this is the greatest live band of all time. And then they introduced themselves. And would you believe it was the opener? <laughs> it was just, I was just like, I fucking love the kooks. And it was actually a band called The Vaccines. I had no idea, but... They were great. You got to try new things, man. You got to buy to Go to the opener. What a delight. What a surprise. <laughs> and that is very me to be like, this is the greatest band that I personally love. And then be like, oh, these are new people entirely? Well, <sighs> what are you going to do? And I did find it weird. I was like, it's weird that all these people that bought Kooks tickets are just kind of like standing here silently watching this band crush. And then it turned out they had not bought tickets to that band. <laughs> Can I say, though, it was weird that they were standing there silently watching that band crush because I was like, even if you don't know this, like I did not know most. I knew like two of the songs. They were phenomenal. They were incredible. They were like, can we play some songs off our new album? And I feel like usually when a band is like, can I play some songs off my new album? If people aren't there for that album, you're like, eh, here we go. It rocked our world. We wrote a movie about it. <laughs> Anyway, so hell yeah, that's my story. Is Was I a bit embarrassed? Of course. Nah. Of course, but delightfully so. <laughs> it's nice to be wrong when being wrong is so right. I found out that I, I do think musicians are handsome when they're older and successful. <laughs> <laughs> All these boys were in suits and I went, I like that. <laughs> I like that they came here from their jobs. <laughs> okay, should we get into this week's book? Yeah, it's intense, so buckle up. This week, we are doing Out of Shape, Worthless Loser, which is my personal memoir. <laughs> Unfunny Dumb Cunt by Claire Parker. <laughs> A memoir of figure skating, fucking up, and figuring it out by Gracie Gold, Olympic go bronze, bronze medalist. medalist. <laughs> so this is a book about her experience in elite figure skating. Which I knew was fucked up. She yeah. only found out recently, <laughs> but I will tell you, I, I knew. <laughs> It's always shocking to see what people don't know about their own lives. Like in this book, she'll be like, don't even think too hard about what figure skating does for people with eating disorders because it's going to upset you. And I was like, were we not supposed to be thinking about that? <laughs> I was like, I've been aware my whole life. She's like, you would not believe it, but the board of an elite sport organization is not looking out for its players. And I'm like, wait, no, <laughs> is it not? I thought the NFL said CTE wasn't that bad because they did the research. <laughs> They looked into it. <laughs> anyway, so we open up and this is one where I'll give her, we did need this back up. How did I get here? My days were meant to be filled with polishing my programs for the upcoming Winter Olympics, wrapping up interviews with the national and international media and awaiting the television rollout of Olympic promotional spots that I had already started. Instead, I was in a recovery center surrounded by heroin addicts and meth users and self-harmers. I was just starting to process how my career as an Olympic figure skater had turned me into a bright, shiny object to be gazed at and admired, only to shatter me in the process. So she is months out from the 2018 Olympics, and instead of working to qualify for the Olympics, she's in rehab. 
She does something I've never seen before, which is in addition to an author's note, which I understand, she's like, listen, this is some tough stuff. And if you are coming to this book from figure skating, you may find it triggering. So proceed with caution. She then does the prologue and the prologue has multiple chapters before we even get to part one, chapter (laughs) one. (laughs) Yeah, this book is really divided up intricately. She's 29 this year. She'll be 29 in August. And this book just came out a few weeks ago. And she has that interesting thing where she's so close to the experiences in this book that this book, I feel like, is longer than it even would have been if she had waited longer. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely some chapters towards the end where it's like, all right, we're good here. But so her other prologue intro is Accessorizing the Truth. And it's about how she's lied so often about her origin story of getting into figure skating that even she forgot the truth. And then she tells the truth. And I'm like... It's not that different. It's not that different. So the lie is that when she was a little girl, she was at the skater rink for a birthday party and she saw a girl's ice skating and she said, please, 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 can I go take lessons? The truth is that she was in ice skating rink and she saw a flyer for like hockey and was like, can I take lessons? And her mom was like, no, you'll get hurt, but I can take you figure skating. And then she went and she loved it. And she's like, that's just a metaphor about the all the lies in my life. And I'm like, I think you can find a stronger metaphor. That feels unimportant. <laughs> yeah, that feels like most girls in the 90s and early 2000s. Oh my God, I, I wanted know. to be a football player so bad. And my parents <laughs> were like, no, we're not gonna let our 12-year-old daughter play football against 14-year-old boys. You'll literally die. <laughs> and I was like, you're so sexist. <laughs> but now I'm like, no, I wouldn't let my son play football against any human being. He'll literally die. Yeah. She also was like, actually, the truth is I'd gone figure skating or like I'd gone ice skating on a pond once when I was like two. So this wasn't even my first time on the ice, actually. Can I tell you, every time I go skiing, it's my quote unquote first time skiing because <laughs> I'm never leaving that fucking bunny hill. I just like, let's pretend let me start it at zero. I think, yeah. <laughs> okay. So then she introduces her personas. You have Gracie Gold, the Olympic medalist, two-time national champion, the one who gets compared to Grace Kelly because she's so beautiful. beautiful. <laughs> she is really cute, though. I will say she's very pretty. Oh, cute as a button. Then you've got Grace Elizabeth, the <laughs> the artsy eccentric who lives in baggy sweatpants and oversized sweatshirts and sneakers with no socks, crochets granny hats and scarves in her free time, wears no makeup and never leaves home without her vape. And then there's her secret self, the out of shape, worthless loser, a judgmental perfectionist whose self-destructive tendencies nearly killed me. And so this book kind of takes us through these personas and then gets to who who she is. Who is she? Can I say? Yeah. Who are any of us? <laughs> Don't know. That's one of those things where, and I think you talk about this all the time. Sometimes people with trauma will like be like, and this thing was so hard for me. And you're like, actually, this is hard for everybody. Like you the other day, you're like, I actually saw this thing that women have this thing that at 3 p.m. they get kind of sleepy and want a snack. And I'm like, no, that's just the human. (laughs) Some things are everything. And she's like, it's worse with ADD. And I'm like, no, (laughs) everybody at 3 p.m. wants a little snack. (laughs) I want to move to Spain where they respect a 3 p.m. nap and a snack. Nobody here understands me. (laughs) So she, from the time she was a little girl, had a compulsion for order. She was very, I know you're not supposed to say like OCD anymore, but I think she later is diagnosed. No, she's fully diagnosed. So she's very like, everything has to be ordered. Everything has to be in its place. She's very tactilely sensitive. She won't wear any clothes. (laughs) (laughs) She's also later diagnosed with ADHD, which I think does have like... Hoops among us, though. I know, but I think that when she like talks about how she could not wear certain things because the tags would like scrape her skin off or like she felt like her skin was getting itched off the bone. I am like, that is a symptom of a disorder. Yeah. And she's like, I don't know. It was just me. She actually ice skated on and off for years without socks, which, you know, when you see your sickness in someone else and you go... (laughs) I got to fix myself. (laughs) You got to wear socks on the ice. I was like, in what world could ice skating barefoot be better? (laughs) But I will say we got socks from Cozy Earth, who are now one of our sponsors. And this is like not a paid ad by them, but they are the softest socks I've ever fucking worn. Oh, my God. You were like, have you tried those socks? And I hadn't opened them yet. And then I did open them and I just wore them like more than one day in a row, which is something that I've really come hard at you for. Not I was like, I this is whatever. I, I just have never really believed in a product this much. I was like, Gracie Gold, you got to try <laughs> Cozy Earth socks. They are so soft. OK, anyway. So she discovers skating. In the beginning, skating was bliss. Twice a week, mom dropped us off at the rink, waved goodbye and said, have fun. Oh, she has a fraternal twin sister. And 
a half sister who's 20 years older than her, who she mentions briefly by being like, when my parents got together, my mom had a daughter from her previous relationship and never mentioned again. I think her name is Kate. Perfection seemed not just a possible, but with enough practice, a reasonable goal. That was reassuring because as far back as I can remember, I hated to make a mistake. So her and her sister start ice skating and she loves it. It was also a good way for her to bond with her mom. Both the little girls were kind of tomboys, as evident by her wanting to be a hockey player. They both wanted to be hockey players. And her mom wanted to dress them up like little dolls and was like, hey, well, here's a way for you to be athletic and get all of your energy out. She was kind of a, a raucous little kid. And then also, here's a way for me to dress you up in sequins. I was surprised to discover that I enjoyed playing dress up. Who knew that a budding femininity was buried within the flannel shirts and oversized hoodies and baggy sweatpants that made up my day-to-day wardrobe? But going glamorous had its downsides too. I struggled with the body-hugging contours of costumes and the accompanying tights, which exacerbated an extreme sensory sensitivity that my loose-fitting clothing helped me manage. Skating made me feel special, at least in the beginning. So basically at the beginning, it's great. She loves it. She says that nobody from the outset thought she was going to be a star, but it also sounded like by the time she started skating at seven, a lot of other kids had been on the ice for four years. So it took her a year or two to catch up and then surpass everybody else. But by the time she was nine, she was being written up in the local news for winning competitions and stuff. Another thing I loved about skating was that there existed a methodical system for learning and advancement. There were so many fun skills to learn from my first swizzle. People gushed to my mom about my athleticism. I can't deny that my love for the sport was tangled up with my mastery of it. But was I good enough to one day skate in the Olympics? So she was. Yeah. Nobody could have predicted it. The odds were stacked against me despite my built-in advantages. My obsession with single repetitive tasks, my natural coordination, my flair for the dramatic, my conventionally attractive looks, and last but certainly not least, my father's anesthesiologist's salary, enough to cover equipment and coaching, which are not cheap. My question was, what were the odds stacked against her then? Just that being an Olympian is hard? Is it a different odd than the odds against everybody else? I think it's just that it's hard and that she started maybe like two, three years later than most Olympians. I will say, I don't think any work you do at the age of five can't be overcome by an adult. Yeah. <laughs> or I guess in this point, a 12-year-old. I also wonder if it's like coming from a not eyes on the prize yeah. family. So she says at the beginning, even though she was obviously very good, the idea that they would take her out of school to work on skating full time was preposterous to her family. The concept of breaking up the golds for something as frivolous as figure skating violated the Midwest social contract that put God and family first. Not to mention that it would have shattered the United Family image we labored to maintain. That being said, the first real accommodation we made for skating happened when I was 9 or 10 and we began making a 300-mile drive every Friday to work with a woman in Springfield, Illinois, who came recommended by my coaches in Missouri. I mean, she didn't even know about skating until she was like 8. So the fact that like a year and a half later, they're like, she's like, we never made accommodations for skating. Until Except I was- for that I'd stop going to school on Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> Except we would drive 300 miles every week one year later. <laughs> so she says, and this is when she starts getting to our family. They come from this, per- I mean, the last name Gold, what a fucking name. The father was an anesthesiologist. He had met the mother while she was working at a nurse at the hospital. They fell in love. They had these two girls by IVF. They were her miracle babies, aside from the baby that she'd already had. And so then she brings up not only was driving all this way great for my potential career, but it turns out it was a good way for my mom to avoid my dad because behind the scenes, the family was falling apart from an early age. Yeah. So she doesn't find this out till much, much later, but her dad suffered from addiction problems and was addicted to fentanyl and had to go to rehab before the girls were born when the mom was pregnant. He also had been caught stealing drugs from hospitals multiple times. He also had a problem with alcohol. And he also had a problem with mistresses. He had been married when he started his affair with their mother, which, you know, you lose them how you get them. So her first coach, the one in Springfield, was this woman who she calls Cruella. And she hates Cruella. She's like, she sucked. And I can't believe adults like gave her so much authority. She says that there was skaters from around the country who the parents would like sign guardianship over to Cruella so that they could train their kids. And she's like, we would have these sleepovers and nothing bad ever happened to me or to anyone that I know of. But it was a weird energy. And I think that the weird energy is this idea that your coach, your skating coach, who's like verbally abusive to these girls and already body shaming them and already pushing them to the breaking point would then be the main caretaker that like adults were so comfortable placing all of the nurturing onto this woman who was not nurturing. When I look back at my struggles now and search for red flags, I should have seen the exact moment when I went off the rails. It would be easy for me to point to people like my coach Cruella, those who transformed skating from something fun into something toxic. But if I'm honest with myself, I have to start much earlier because the conditions that would later contribute to my high profile crash and burn had already been established on the day I was born. So this is when she gets into her parents' 
background. And then she talks about the difference between her and her sister. And I cannot even imagine growing up that competitive with a fraternal twin sister. And she says from out the gate, it was Grace Stormcloud and Carly Sunshine. That Grace was chaotic and full of energy and talked back and wanted it her way and was really intense and competitive. And Carly was the people pleaser. And the family, she was the one who kept it all together, who was kind of everybody's go-to point person and ultimately shouldered a lot of the burden of the emotional problems of the family. Yeah. Carly also skated with her and was very good, but wasn't hyper competitive. She was competitive with herself. And she talks a lot about the way she admires that Carly was always just trying to get her own personal best, not beat everyone. I do think like that perspective, her trying to understand Carly and the way that she analyzes Carly's outlook. I am like, I don't know. I do think that that sounds like an Olympian trying to make sense of how somebody else cannot will themselves to be the best. Yeah. The way that she was like, when I think of Carly's approach, self-preservation is what comes to mind. Skating was never more important than her own well-being. I do think Carly was just a great skater who was a human being. There's a lot of people who are good at skating in high school. He didn't go on to the Olympics. Yeah. And I do think this kind of putting a philosophy behind it is someone like Gracie, whose brain is like, well, if you're going to do something, why wouldn't you be the best in the whole world at it? Trying to even make sense of somebody who would be happy just being really good at their hobby. (laughs) Yeah. I also wonder how much of it was informed by having a sister that was Gracie, who was so obviously unraveling from the beginning with the pressures of this sport. Like, She almost never competed without having a complete mental breakdown. Like she also worked really hard. She's like, I was the kid who begged for more practice time, who would do something 50 times. Even if I fell 50 times, I would get on the 51st time. I wonder if as your sister, you look and say, well, if that's what it takes to be first. I don't want to (laughs) place. I'll never be first. So I can just let myself off the hook. Yeah. If I did my best and finished fifth, it would be the worst outcome imaginable. If my best effort is good enough for only fifth, what am I doing here? If I'm not capable of winning, what's the point? That's where I was coming from. It was a mindset encouraged by my parents who always counseled us that anything worth doing was worth doing really, really well. She also goes into kind of her mom's psychology. She really tries as best as she can to let her mom off the hook in this book. Uh, I would say she's pretty hard on her mom. She is hard on her mom, but she gives a lot of context for why she's mad at her mom. And yes, compared to how bad her dad is. Like, yeah, I don't even say she was hard on her mom. She's very honest, honest and angry at her parents. But she's been to a lot of therapy. So there's a lot of like trying to come from a place of understanding. (laughs) Her best chance at upward mobility wasn't a job. It was marriage to an upwardly mobile man. And she talks about her mom's eating disorder. Mom was taught that as women still are, that smallness equaled strength. She says she's never known her mom to just like eat normally. She describes pretty specifically an almond mom. This was the first book I've read that was a really good book where I saw the influences of like TikTok jargon seep in. There was a couple of references where I'm like, okay, I know the exact video you watched that informed the verbiage you used. My family's foundation was crumbling at least as far back as our preschool years when mom found out dad was cheating on her after the damning evidence arrived in the mail. So her dad's driver's license was mailed back by a hotel where he'd left his like wallet at the hotel or something. And it was in the neighborhood. (laughs) Yeah. She's like, so even though my mom was really tough on me, my dad wasn't very present. And when he was there, he had a hair trigger temper that terrified me. I internalized from my parents that to be liked or accepted, I should keep my ugly parts hidden. All those big feelings I had weren't going to win me any friends or influence people. Best to keep them stuffed down. And then, of course, that gets exacerbated by the very nature of figure skating, where you have to just be like shiny and happy and beautiful when you're under like extreme stress. In addition to having constant affairs her entire childhood, she realized that it seemed pretty clear that he was trading off being my dad to impress someone he wanted to bed. It made me sick to my stomach to consider that somewhere a woman might be watching me skate on TV and saying, that's the daughter of the man I'm fucking. How fucking disgusting is that? Like, she's like, dad is awful. We would see him texting other women and be like, oh yeah, I'm with my daughter at this competition. She's going to win. She's at nationals. Ew. If you are a mistress, you fucking do not talk about the children. That's gross. That should turn you off. To acknowledge that the person you're sleeping with, like, listen, it's bad when they have a wife, but to like get the children involved, fucking horrific. She also really acknowledges how bad they fucked up with Carly. She's like, they cared about my results so much more because there's just so much more potential there because of her just obsessive drive. Even when we were there to support Carly, we often came up short. I remember one time mom and I slept through Carly's short program at her regionals because we were jet lagged. She'd be in the locker room after competing, so excited to tell us how she'd done and no one would pick up their phone. Oh, God. 
she does question a lot. You know, obviously they pushed me too hard and they put too much emphasis on my talent and my capabilities and my successes. And she's like, I did end up feeling like me being good at figure skating was going to be the thing that held the family together. But it's tricky because there's no guarantee that I wouldn't have ended up presenting like hell if they had held me back. Sadly, I ended up presenting them anyway. This is the idea like, this is what it takes to make an Olympian. You have to push your child so fucking hard and basically dedicate your entire life to making your child the best in the country at something. But then you can't put in all that work and not have the child feel the pressure. But then if you don't put in that work, are you holding your kid back from greatness? Uh, I hope I have the most average goddamn kid. (laughs) I'm sure I will. (laughs) By the numbers. Can I say that's the best thing you could have, though? Because someone who is like happy and average and then like can carry that over to a happy and average adult life. Like what's better than that? What's better than being down the middle? If you like that about yourself, I love that for you. As someone who loves to hang out with people, put me in the middle of the bell curve, please. Famously, I wish I was a salmon. (laughs) I just want to swim with my friends. I want to be a pigeon. They're not understood, but they're around. I want us to be one shiny flock squiggling down the stream together. Who's who? I don't know. Doesn't matter. At 14 years old, I arrived at a fork in the road. As a novice, I had just finished fourth at the 2010 U.S. Championships in Spokane, Washington. So this is when she has to go to school online because it's take it seriously or get the foik out. Starting in our sophomore year, Carly and I attended our classes online and my skating got worse. I took a step backward when I finished sixth at the Midwestern sectionals during the 2010 to 2011 season. It turns out the reason she's getting worse is because she's going through puberty. And when your body adjusts and you get new height and your your center of gravity shifts, you have to like jump different. Yeah. So she grew six inches in like the matter of months, which begs the question when she says my skating got so much worse. They mean like she got worse in April than she was in March. And they were like, well, well, do we give up everything? I mean, the amount of times that that does happen throughout this book where she's like, I don't know, I was two points behind. So why keep going? Yeah. Everything I thought I had gained in August, I lost in a weekend in September. So do I even look towards October? That's what's so weird about these intense gymnasts and ice skaters. Anybody whose career kind of comes to a halt at the age of 21 is so much fucking happens in seven years. It's very Jada Pinkett Smith of, If you don't take a second to breathe, like when you take a step back, you go, yeah, it's okay to have a one or two month off period. But I guess not if your entire career is seven years. Yeah. Man, we should do another Olympics book or two this summer. I'm very curious about these mofos. So she does, through this puberty sitch, get a sports psychologist who is helpful. But at the end of the day, like it literally is just, I don't know, bodies change. And they gave her a couple of weeks to figure it out and she was able to adapt. She gets a new coach at this time also, Alex. And Alex is a Ukrainian Looney Tune. (laughs) (laughs) He was nearing 60 and was naturalized citizen of the United States where he had lived for more than 25 years. He could see that he had a challenge on his hands. I had a great lift in my jumps thanks to my natural athletic ability. But once I was airborne, my arms were all over the place. So he was very technically skilled and had been trained by like the USSR masters. And he was hugely helpful to her at first. So he also kept a record of weights and heights. And because of that, her mom started weighing her and Carly pretty regularly. The problem is with these coaches is that these little girls are their meal tickets. So essentially, he's looking at Gracie and saying, if I can make her an Olympian, then my personal training rates go through the roof. My credibility goes through the roof. So I need for my adult man's compensation to make this little girl a star. In the 2011-2012 season, she makes her international debut at the Junior Grand Prix event. In Estonia. In Estonia. Is it the Grand Prix? I don't care. And then here's what's weird. Mitch Moyer was the U.S. figure skating senior director of athlete high performance at the time. In his mind, I had everything. The jumps, the looks, the name. All I lacked was international experience. So even though this is her first like international senior event, he picks her for the American team, which is... One of those things that goes to show you the politics behind team making. The idea that this sport where they're all being ranked constantly, that he would pick somebody who hasn't been around as long and hasn't proven themselves because he knew that she would sell as an American persona. Yeah. That America would fall in love with the source. Because something I did not realize is that the United States has been getting their ass kicked in international competitions, ice skating. We have not podiumed since Sarah Hughes in 2002. She was the last gold, and then Sarah Co- Sasha Cohen yeah. was our last podium in maybe 2006. And when I think about it, because I didn't actually know who Gracie Gold was, and when you think about like the last time that we had big name figure skaters, I guess if you've been paying attention, you would know who Gracie Gold was, because she, I guess, got a lot of media attention. 
But yeah, but I, I don't really know feel her. like it's seeped into the public sphere in the way that say like gymnastics has because Dude, I can name so, all those bitches because Michaela we've Maroney, been so Gabby successful Douglas. in gymnastics yeah. like we've been kicking ass in gymnastics so those are like mainstream celebrities mm-hmm. whereas I think sports that we don't do as well in I guess it's a big deal in those communities but I don't really know what's going on yeah you forget that these people just like anything else there's the athletic performance of an athlete and then there is the promotional and commercial capabilities of an athlete and they're not always one and the same yes So because of her promotional vibes, he goes, this is a girl that they're going to pay attention to. So she kind of gets, not kind of, she fully gets preferential treatment for the entire beginning chunk of her career. So they send her to Tokyo and she finishes fifth. They also send her to a management company, IMG. She then goes to Nebraska. And I think there she does well. Sorry, this is much like those tennis things where it's like, And then I place here and then I place here and then you're like, okay, how do we put this into a larger narrative arc? And she's obsessively practicing. She says that in order to get a jump, she would practice 56 times until she got it exactly perfect. And she would film every single one and then she would go home and watch them. But in these early years, the pattern was long established. Fiasco, implosion, redemption, equanimity. As I like to say, I was always playing with fire. Anger is a powerful emotion and it gave me strength, energy and power, at least in the short term. The problem with using anger as fuel is it's not sustainable. So basically, she is somebody who establishes early on that as a figure skater, she's a bit of a head case in terms of she can nail something in practice 100 times. She is technically one of the best skaters out there. At her best, she is the best, but she's known for like going out there and sometimes getting in her head and kind of botching it. Yeah. So she and Alex have a very tumultuous relationship. He is a big yeller and she is a yell backer. So she gets kind of a reputation for being difficult, even though this is just sort of their dynamic. And also she seems a little bit difficult, but only because she's so in her head about disappointing everybody all the time. Alex was exploding almost daily. Practices grew death stare intense. Looking back on this time, what is painfully obvious is that I was going through puberty in front of coaches and high-ranking U.S. figure skating officials, most of whom were men with no clue what was appropriate to say to girls on the precipice of adulthood. So Alex has this system where when Gracie messes up, every other skater that he works with gets punished. Two mistakes for Gracie running for all is his approach, where if she makes two errors, everybody has to run laps. And if she makes enough mistakes for there to be 10 laps, then her laps get doubled. Well, no, no matter what, her laps are doubled. Oh. And he says, well, how do you expect to be better than everybody if you're doing the same thing as everybody? I mean, so their relationship is very tough. And in this weird way, it's... This mutual love and obsession, I often pictured Alex, not my father, walking me down the aisle at my wedding. That's how much he meant to me. She says he was one of the first coaches that would ever ask her about what kind of music she liked or what she did off the ice. It was the first time she was treated like a human being. And I think what's true for Gracie is she was desperate to be seen by anyone in her life as something other than a figure skater. And anybody who gave her the opportunity to open up, she latched onto them and gave them a lot of weight. Yeah. All I can say is a certain amount of pushing is necessary to mold a great athlete into an Olympian. And in the process, it's easy for supportive parents to morph into a meddler. In this environment, the line between motivational tactics and abuse can be as thin as as a skating blade. It's easy to cross without realizing it. The problem is Alex is a severe alcoholic and she doesn't realize it until many years later. They finally hit the final straw when it's her birthday. So her mom brings this cannoli cake for her and Carly to the ice rink. And Alex keeps her on the ice through the whole party. He won't let her get off the ice. She has to keep working and it's working her and working. 18th birthday. Yeah. And then when she wants to just go get a piece of cake, he calls her fat. So they're like, okay, we have to leave Alex. Like, this is just too much. But she says between like the demands of figure skating and her mom's dieting obsession, it signaled to me that being unable to control one's weight wasn't about nutrition or biology. It was a goddamn character flaw. Often, if she couldn't land something or if she messed up, you'd go, it's because your butt's too big. So she really had this idea that like if she can control her weight, that is like the problem standing between her and anything she can't do. After this birthday party, they end up having to break up with Alex. And this is pretty soon before Sochi. This is, I think, a couple months before the Olympics. And it's a huge deal to leave your coach right before the Olympics. They seemed unmoved by my explanation that Alex's verbal and emotional abuse had gone too far. They wondered why I couldn't just make it work until after the Olympics. Nobody seemed to notice that I was heartbroken. She ends up going to Detroit to work with Marina and Oleg. You guys know them, right? <laughs> you know Marina and Oleg. If not for Alex, I never would have been an Olympian. He was the Dr. Frankenstein behind the creation of Gracie Gold. 
That's a fact. But if I had stayed with him, I never would have made it to Sochi. And the quest to mold me into the best version of myself, he nearly destroyed me. So Marina and Oleg hook her up with this guy named Frank Carroll, who had previously coached Michelle Kwan and a bunch of other great figure skaters. And he is pragmatic and honestly just what she needs at this time, even though their relationship, it never really became what she wanted it to be. He is very focused on saying, like, just do your job. That's his thing. It's like, you've trained this hard, now go out on the ice and just do it. And he's very, like, even keeled. So something odd about the Olympic situation is that they record a lot of the press for it before the Olympic team is determined. So the summer before the Winter Olympics, she is doing, like, commercials for his visa, commercials for United. She is doing press photos and stuff to ramp up for the Olympics. And she has not officially made the Olympic team. And so now she has this kind of entourage and she says, becoming the Grace Kelly of skating left me with a lot of gestures angling to be a part of my royal court. So she's in this weird ramp up phase where she's what, 18 years old. She has not even technically made the Olympic team yet, but she's making all this money from it. She's represented by IMG. Somebody put out into the public this idea that she was Grace Kelly because they have the same name and they're both blonde, I guess. Yeah. And so she became very much commercial gold and everybody is kind of coming in and seeing if they can take a piece of that pie. Okay, Frank tells her something that is a revelation, which is you don't have to be the best. You have to be the best of the day. Like you don't have to do a flawless performance. He's just saying your best today has to be better than everyone else's. Yeah. And I think it really hones in on the fact that like this moment, like if somebody else messes up, then you can mess up a little bit, but you just have to be better than them right now. You don't have to be the fastest person, but you can't be the slowest when you're getting chased by a bear. (laughs) Yeah, except for you have to be the most not slowest. Yeah. In that you're the fastest. Right. But you don't have to break a world record. You just have to like, yes, not get eaten by a bear. <laughs> Should I be a skating coach? <laughs> okay. Imagine me and Claire as your skating coaches. Get out there and be the most, not worst. <laughs> Can I say something that someone said to me when I ran track in high school? And I only quote it because he was like a very hot guy at our high school. But he said, the 100 meter dash is not about accelerating the fastest. It's about who can decelerate the slowest. (laughs) (laughs) And he was Jamaican. And I was just like, I don't know, man. I feel like you know something I don't know. And I have taken that with me. And I say it to people often. I go, it's it's not about accelerating the fastest, it's about decelerating the slowest. Okay, that's very important to me, actually. I don't think that that's wrong looking at, like, for careers. I agree. It's not about getting to the top fastest. It's about, like, falling off slowest. Especially in this, like, burnout era that we're all in. Okay, actually? (laughs) Okay. It's not about being the best. It's about being the least not bad. (laughs) It's not about being the best. It's about falling off the least. That's kind of Gracie Gold's whole thing. Totally. So she has a great time just pushing through and compartmentalizing all of her pain. She thinks the more your body hurts, that means you're just like trying really good. So when she's qualifying for the Olympics, she gets like a crazy high score. She does a great job. My 72.12 was the highest score earned by a woman at the U.S. Championship under the International Skating Union's international judging system. Four minutes of clean skating was all that stood between me and an Olympic berth. So she goes out there to do her job and she fucking nails it. As I arched my back and dropped my shoulders and head towards the ice, I was actually thinking, you just qualified for the Olympics. If you watch the replay, you'll see me reflexively pump the air with my right fist after I nailed the last jump. It had to be involuntary because I'd never done anything like that before. I can only assume that becoming an Olympian triggered that primal celebration. I knew I had skated a strong program, but to win the free skate by nearly 13 points to earn my first national title in a route over Polina Edmonds was beyond my wildest dreams. 14 months after making my senior debut, I was a national champion and an Olympian. That part made me emotional. Me too. For her to be like in a spin being like, (laughs) I'm nailing it. (sighs) I was like, you are nailing it. Great job. So she says she's not even overjoyed. She was just relieved that she was definitely going to go to the Olympics now. And she's like coming to the Olympics at this time where figure skating in America is really struggling. So they're pushing her as hard as they can. She was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And she didn't even know she was going to be on the cover until they passed it to her. And she had taken those photos before she had even made the team. Also, of course, there's a name like Gracie Gold. There was a lot of headlines. All that glitters is Gracie Gold, America's golden girl, good as gold, leading the gold rush, new gold standard, worth her weight in gold, gold for it. (laughs) (laughs) 
And then she goes to the Olympics. They have them do a team program that she wasn't even sure if she wanted to participate in. Sorry, the whole Olympics it just kind of zooms by. Team USA as this team program gets bronze. And this is a brand new event. There's never been team events before. So they get bronze and she's like, okay, well, at least I know now that I'll go home with a medal. Yeah. And thank God for it because that's the medal she gets. Yeah. So for the rest of the Olympics, she ends up placing fourth, which she calls the worst place, which I've heard third is the worst place. I heard first is the worst and second is the best. And third place, rumor has it, has this spectacularly hairy chest. (laughs) Correct me if I'm wrong. That's what I'm hearing. No. So she gets fourth and she's like, no, that's actually the worst because you're so close to the podium and you didn't make it. And if you're fifth, you're like, wow, fifth in the world. Pretty good. But fourth sucks ass. And I was like, "Mm, good explanation. And then the Olympics are over. In Sochi, everywhere I turned, a camera was pointed at me. There was no time to decompress. I was struck by this thought. You didn't do your job. And now you'll never know if your best would have been good enough to meddle. Just a couple of little interesting notes about the Olympics while we breeze through this is one. So they go to the opening ceremonies and then they flew to Austria to practice away from the Olympics. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Second of all, by the time we arrived back in Sochi, I was a nervous wreck. I was uptight about my fitness, by which I mean my weight, by which I mean my eating. I was paranoid about gaining a few pounds dining in the Athletes Village cafeteria anchored by free McDonald's food. Also, when they were in Austria, they ate at Hooters every night. Because that was the only restaurant near them. Okay. Why are America's top athletes eating Hooters and McDonald's the entire... Like, there has to be other food. I just, like, don't understand why Jennifer Aniston is on, like, a regimented program of protein and fiber and kale. But a star athlete is offered free McDonald's. <laughs> I mean, Russia's giving their team drugs and our team gets McDonald's. Why can't we support our athletes? That's such a good question. Like, I'm sorry, I understand you want to get the money from McDonald's. But at the end of the day, isn't it more important to support our young men and women and people? The main one that I don't understand is why when they spent like a week in Austria, were they not like trying to find a vegetable? Or like meal prepping. Why can't their coach make them little turkey sandwiches and slice up an orange? Great question. Like, Why is a peewee soccer mom a better nutritionist than an Olympic coach? (laughs) Nobody eats worse than a fucking top of their game athlete in their early 20s. Remember when John McEnroe was like, I had to get in top condition and that meant not eating a chocolate sundae every day. (laughs) Remember when Andre Agassi was like, If I wanted to win another Grand Slam, I was going to have to learn to touch my toes. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to have to exercise. (laughs) I don't really understand sports, to be honest. (laughs) Okay, and then we get into uh, body issues. It sometimes strikes me as less a sport than a magic act. Come see the pretty girl in a tiny dress execute the hardest moves possible while making it look effortless. The sport sells an image of easy athleticism and natural beauty, and that is very appealing until you know how the illusion is achieved. I was struck by that because it is so crazy to think how easy these women make like these insane feats of athleticism look. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the scoring is like if you make it look hard, you lose. I'd venture to guess that many of us who exercise the most are actively consuming fewer calories in general than our sedentary peers because Decades of intense exercise have turned our bodies into impressive machines that burn energy with maximum efficiency. So this is where she gets into her eating disorder. Fat shaming is also just part of the culture in these sports where there's just like a certain body ideal for women, especially because a lot of the things that are judged are like lines and how the shape of a move looks. And so if your body isn't like rail thin, then you lose points. Mm -hmm. Also, In a sport where so many contestants are prepubescent to have a woman's body, Mm -hmm. you're like being judged against people who don't. Yeah. And you can't starve yourself. Well, I guess you can, but it's hard to starve yourself down to a prepuberty body. Yeah. I asked for technical advice and I got body dysmorphia because Alex didn't have the first clue what it was like to be a girl going through puberty in the spotlight. I was subsisting on less than 500 calories a day. Looking back, I can see that my behavior was yet another coping strategy. The time I spent obsessing over how many calories I consumed was time not obsessing about the Olympics. My mantra became, if I don't eat today, everything will be great. If I'm thin enough, my problems will disappear. When I looked around, I noticed for the first time that I was surrounded by girls in size two or zero costumes. Once open, my eyes could not unsee all the real thin figures in my midst. So she starts starving herself and people think she looks great. 
tale as old as time, someone who's like extremely sick gets a lot of positive affirmation for it. That's the tricky part about eating disorders and skating. As you advance deeper into your teens to continue progress, it's almost essential to have one. Thinner people have longer lines. She hits this post-Olympics blues that's quite common where her eating disorder was like leading towards a place, get to the Olympics, get to the Olympics. Post-Olympics, there was nothing really to work for anymore because skating works on a four-year cycle because it's kind of all about the Olympics. The best thing that happened to her post-Olympics was becoming friends with Taylor Swift for a minute. Yeah, Taylor tweeted at her and said, so cool, I want to be her friend, and then invited her over to make cookies at her loft. And then a few months later, or a few weeks later, she was in LA, and she's like, do you want to come to Catalina with us? And so she got to go to the Catalina Island with Taylor and some friends. Including Lord. I think this was 1989 era, Taylor, right? Yeah, this was 2015. We had lunch and ice cream cones for dessert, then sailed back to the mainland. It's so interesting to me that Taylor Swift has like female platonic booty calls. Yeah. There are people that she's like, I'm in town if you want to hang out. Slide through. Slide through if you want to make cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be making cookies back at mine if you're like around tonight. <laughs> <laughs> just saw you uh, win the Olympics. You want to come over later? <laughs> There's just a huge letdown after the Olympics. How can I fix a malaise that nobody else saw? And this begins the downward spiral that is because she feels that like no one sees or understands her in the slightest. I thought making the Olympics would solve all my problems, but I came back from Sochi with the same body dysmorphia, the same self-hatred, the same tangled family dynamics, all of which were exacerbated by my higher public profile. And she says, like, when you're a high publicity person, the way that all these people feel the right to exploit you, like every interview, every media outlet, somebody was surprising her or something or like she just felt exhausted and used by everybody. My powers of dissociation were so well practiced by then, it felt like most of the time I was outside my body looking down on myself. So she gets a stress fracture that she like competed with and did really well with actually when she's in Japan. Then this becomes just like a series of competitions where she's slowly unraveling. She also becomes addicted to laxatives. I also want to point out this is where she first kind of dives into her rivalry with Ashley Wagner, who she says they didn't really have a rivalry, but Ashley Wagner is going to come up later. They were just kind of always battling contemporaries. Yeah, it was always one or the other for best. Her Borg, if you will. Yeah. I love this line, though. The media made us out to be rivals along the lines of Tanya and Nancy, but it was a forced narrative that reporters ran with for page clicks and content. The only thing that was said about us that was truthful was that we didn't much care for each other. I agree with this. I think that if you are like top of field with another person, the way the media is like you're either best friends or worst enemies. And you can be like, I don't know, we obviously just don't get along, but like I don't wish ill upon them. No, I know what you mean. And obviously there's room for nuance, but it is so funny to be like, we're not rivals. We're just two people who constantly compete for the exact same prize. Always duke it out, mano a mano, and don't like each other. (laughs) That's different. (laughs) I was trying to think of someone with us that I would compare it to, but we're such petty bitches. I'm like, I do wish ill upon everybody. (laughs) Everyone's my rival. Even people on my team, which is the problem. I'm constantly competing with Bug for best in house. I'm not because I won. (laughs) Yeah, right. She's addicted to laxatives. With overuse, the efficacy of the laxatives waned, a problem solved by turning to other drugs, including a few whose main purpose was to treat diabetes, but whose side effects included weight loss. An early Ozempic gal. Ah. She competes at the Grand Prix in France, the Trophée Eric Bompard. She won kind of like by default because of a terrorist attack. And she is like mad about it. At my best, I was an addict craving the adrenaline rush. At my worst, I was a perfectly accessorized packet of anxiety in fight or flight mode. I never could be sure which me would show up. So she has a couple years after the Olympics where she keeps going to these major competitions and sometimes she crushes it and sometimes she just falls apart and falls on her ass. And she is, as described by commentators, constantly like a head case. And she can't control it either. She doesn't know what's going on. And she is horrible to the people around her. Like she relies so heavily on her mom and her sister to keep her together, even though she's going to fall apart anyway. She says that before every single competition, and this is pre-Olympics too, she would just call her mom and her sister blubbering, a sobbing mess every single time. She just, every competition she would do this. She's like fucked up when she doesn't do as well as she wants to or as well as people think she should. The world championships are on the corner in Boston and the world championships would be the defining moment for me. It would be the competition where Gracie Gold, as the world knew her, ceased to exist. So what happens is she comes in fourth. 
And I guess it's a big deal to her because it's in the US. It's in Boston. She keeps saying, oh, I'll get on the podium. I'll get on the podium. And then she comes in fourth. And she has like a breakdown. And she goes from reporter to reporter and says, I'm so ashamed. I feel so humiliated. It's just so accurate that I came in fourth. I couldn't motivate myself to get going. I didn't do well enough. The media volunteer grew increasingly alarmed. She'd never heard someone talk with such self-loathing. She would later say that she wanted to shake some sense into me, get right up in my face and say, don't talk that way about yourself. You're still one of the best in the world. The truth, I didn't lose any shape. My family was what was coming apart and I was so fucking sad about it. It was a totally normal reaction to what was going on. But in figure skating, there's no room for anything but happy faces. And so at this point, she's like, what should have happened is I should have taken a break. Like I should have found some emotional support. I should have taken six months off skating and not competed. And then like for the next programs that really mattered for the Olympics, I would have been back on my game. But instead, what happened is her coach kept making her compete. She kept on forcing herself into these competitions where she would just completely come undone. And especially, she really traces it back to this fourth place competition where, I don't know, man. I feel like to be fourth in the world. Also, no offense, but coming out of being fourth at the Olympics, which is presumably another like world championship. Yeah. Why would that be such a shock? Yeah. Why would it be crazy to be like, oh, I'm exactly where I was a few months ago? Something interesting to me here is that after this loss, she's very mad at Frank because Frank seems disappointed in her. She's like, I wish Frank had just said to me, it's not the end of the world. It's fine. You can do it next time. But he didn't say that. Because then later in the book, she's like, how come when I'm a set, all anybody ever says to me is keep your chin up. You'll get him next time. Why can't anybody ever just admit that it sucked? And it's a small death. I'm like, I don't know. Because then when somebody says that, you're like, well, it's his fault that I unraveled. Because if he had just told me it was not a big deal and I could keep my chin up. I would have kept going. That was like a hard part for me in this book is that there were a lot of things that other people could have done in her mind to prevent her from like fully going off the rails, which I don't think is true because she does suffer from a lot of mental illnesses that I think with intense competition would have come to a head eventually, no matter what. Like there's always something in this book that someone else could have done. And I really don't feel like that's necessarily a fair thing to put on other people. And I think that like if she'd written this book later, this would have read kind of differently. She's very upset with ice skating as a whole for not caring that she was obviously not doing well. The point I was too overwhelmed to artfully make to Mitch, the head of figure skating, was this. If you're not going to make an investment over time to get to know people, we might as well be cogs in your high performance machine. You can't act like we're family if there's no bonding. They couldn't genuinely care about me because they didn't genuinely know me. So they are like, what's going on with you? But she's like, you don't give a fuck. And of course they don't. Yeah. And I feel bad that they don't, but they obviously don't. Like there's a lot of upset that happens between her and figure skating her and Frank her and like other people who she believes could have been looking out for her when the truth is like there was a lot of self-sabotage. And then also her family is terrible. (laughs) Yeah. So what she's saying is basically like everybody was like, what's going on? They all think that I'm so crushed by this fourth place result that like that's why then I kind of spiral out and then stop doing really well at other competitions. But the truth is I'm upset because my family is coming apart and my mom is drinking a lot and my dad is going through shit and I just can't handle the stress. And she's like, when I get on this ice to compete, that's all I can think about. I like, can't keep my head in the game. And meanwhile, everybody's telling her to grow up and stop being a baby. Everyone, like all the journalists and all of the reviews and the commentators and even her sister is like, okay, you have to snap out of this thing where you're beating yourself up for that fourth place finish. Meanwhile, though, like she is saying, if other people hadn't held me so responsible for this fourth place finish, I wouldn't have been so upset. But then later she's talking about a doping scandal and she's like, I think I might have actually been third place. And if I had been third place, I never would have spiraled. And it's just like, ah. She goes, or maybe I still would have. It probably doesn't matter. It definitely just doesn't matter. Yeah, but I do think if you gave up your whole life to try to medal at the Olympics, it would be annoying to be like, and I lost because other people were cheating. Yeah. I compared every event to the Olympics, and every time I demanded the same level of performance I delivered in Sochi, whether it was a small summer competition or the world championships, I was continuously chasing the Olympic high I'd experienced and falling short. It was almost as if I couldn't empty my mind of all the clutter and plant myself in the here and now and I became an architect of my self-destruction. She wants a break so badly, but because it's for mental health reasons, she's like, no one would let me because there is this belief in skating that you're throwing it all away unless there's a physical reason you need to stop. And she says, I almost wish I had just dropped a weight on my foot so that I could have had a break. Looking back, I wish I had spoken up and said I should not be competing. I advocated for a break, but not forcefully enough. Nobody listened, or if they did, nothing came of it. That part is really sad. Like she should have taken a break here. 
Around this time too, Carly starts like moving on with her life. She goes back to college. She gets a boyfriend. She starts having a normal life. And so Gracie feels a bit abandoned by her. She's like, Carly was my number one emotional stabilizer. And we were not growing apart because they're still super, super close and best friends, but she doesn't have her every day there. Also, her mom is starting to feel like an empty nester. And her mom is kind of acting crazy. She says her mom is calling her repeatedly on the phone that if she left for the ice at eight, she would call her nonstop and it would only be 11. And she'd be like, well, I haven't heard from you all day. If Gracie and Carly went to get lunch, the mom would drive to the restaurant to check and make sure they were okay. Like, that's an insane way to treat your 21-year-old daughters. Yeah. I also want to say, I think Carly was the only person in her life, which is a lot of pressure for Carly because it seems, again, like she's expanding her life, getting a boyfriend, doing things. I don't know throughout the book that Gracie ever really mentions another person. Like even future relationships, she like meets her girlfriend through Carly's friend group. Like, I don't know that she ever knows people. I think she like knows other people in the skate world, but it's very like tennis and that your friends can't be your enemies. Yeah. The only aspect to my normal routine that I adhered to religiously was my diet. It was the last form of control that I had. So she is just not eating. Carly was rarely home and I couldn't blame her. She was finally putting herself first. Frank realizes that she has an eating disorder, which like, fucking duh, Frank. What is wrong with you? The problem is nobody cares because it's not actually the eating disorder that's the problem. It's the way that it's like her yo-yo dieting and the way that it affects her emotions. And her focus. Like nobody's upset that she's eating 500 calories a day. They're upset that the eating 500 calories a day seems to be negatively affecting her. Yeah. I wasn't equipped to articulate what I needed to Frank. Our relationship was doomed from the start when I presented myself as the skater I believed he wanted me to be. So she has this thing where she wishes Frank could have been her forever coach because he was so good about not yelling at her and reframing her mindset and helping her with the mental part of her game just as much as the physical. But when she met him, she was on this two-week probation period where she was between coaches right before the Olympics. And he was like, I've heard she's difficult. I'll give her two weeks, see how she does. And Gracie took this to be like, for the rest of our time together, I'm on probation. Essentially, I can never open up to you. I can never trust you. And she defines trust as the ability to yell at somebody, which I am like, I do think we have to dig into therapy a little bit more and ask why to you, the highest honor you can give to someone in a relationship is to be like abusive towards them. Yeah. She's like, when I really love you, I'll just scream at you and throw a tantrum when I'm having a bad day. But that's a good thing. Okay. (laughs) But still, she was always worried that she was not good enough for Frank. She competes somewhere, another one of these things, Skate America in 2016. It goes wrong. Either she's second or she's fourth, but she's so upset. And she is devastated by the comments of the commentators, Tara Lipinski and Johnny Weir. Who are saying that she's ungrateful and needs to snap out of being so bad, which is insane. Just this like frivolousness of being like, just snap out of it as if anybody who knows anything about high performing athletes it's like 90 percent mental at some point yeah like snap out of w- snap into it like it's hard to snap into it like she's not doing it on purpose i don't think she's going to the ice rink to lose on purpose yeah it's fucking hard of course she's not going to the ice rink to lose on purpose but i also not to defend the commentators but like their job is to like weave a narrative that's engaging for the people to listen to and i think they should be more conscious of like how it affects the skaters that they're like inventing a story about But the way that Gracie takes it so personally, like earlier when she's like, oh, I heard them talking about basketball and they didn't talk about the players like that. It is like the nature of the sport. Yeah, but I guess that's why I expect better from the people who came out of the sport. Yeah, I I think there's a way to say she's like physically strong and capable for her. It's a mental battle and the pressures without being like, Ugh, snap, out of snap out of your depression get over it no i agree that's what i mean is like on both sides i think that they were wrong with what they said but i do think like it's true like we have to describe what we're seeing which is she is a technically the most skilled skater out there what's happening is she's botching things she's fully capable of doing like for her to take it as a personal attack i'm yeah. like it's probably not they're not right but that's not what they're doing either yeah the whole sport is based on random people judging you So can we not simply acknowledge that under these conditions, being a top performer and dealing with a mental health crisis are not mutually exclusive? The rest of my 2016, 2017 was a dumpster fire. So basically, Frank fires her publicly. But meanwhile, her mom has become an alcoholic and is like blackout drunk constantly and screaming at Gracie and Carly a lot. At first, Frank is like, go back to Alex for a couple of weeks for like a little Alex boot camp. And that obviously goes terribly because Alex is an alcoholic who is really mean. 
Also, what turns out to be happening with her family is that her dad was caught stealing prescription pills again and lost his job and lied to the family about it for a few months and then finally came clean to the mom who came clean to Carly. And then Gracie was the last to know because she was considered like this hothouse flower who couldn't be upset because she can't handle the truth of the family, which is true to some degree. But I understand that that's not like what you like to feel like your family thinks about you. Yeah. What they're really reinforcing here is that if your skating goes bad, then the whole family falls apart. Right. And I feel like the whole second half of this book kind of like lands in this weird middle ground of like, if you tell her something, she'll kind of unravel. But if you don't tell her something, she'll also unravel. Yeah. Yeah. It turned out the family had like no money now because the dad was unemployed. Yeah. And struggling with drugs again. So then she lashes out at Frank and then he fires her publicly. He like releases a statement being like, I'm not working with her anymore. And then she has to release a statement being like, I wish she'd told me. So she moves to Detroit to work with Marina and Oleg. Her fallback coaches. In Detroit. And Detroit is where things absolutely go off the rails. So now she's in her 20s. She's living alone in Detroit and she's supposed to be training with Marina and Oleg, but she just stops going to the rink. She falls into an absolute depression where she mostly just stays in her house and watches Dexter and like binge eats. And every now and then she'll show up at the rink, but rarely. She also around this time is assaulted by a fellow skater at a party. And it's how she has her virginity taken from her. It's the first time she ever has sex. I mean, it's like a horrible story to read, especially because she reports it eventually and nothing comes of it. Her sister was in the same hotel room, but didn't know what was happening. And she kind of internalizes it and takes the guilt on herself and doesn't tell people for a really long time. So it, again, just like adds fuel to the fire of her isolation and the way that she's spiraling alone. There's just like a lot of horrible things happening at once. She just can't hold up the front anymore of being an effortless figure skater. Like there's so much happening to her that she can't hide. And so instead she just hides her entire self. And this guy shows up again a couple of times. Like he tries to come to brunch with her and her friends the next day. And she says at the party, people were like, you have to leave here because you won't stop following Gracie around. Like it was well known that he had a crush on her and that he was really like aggressive in asking her out and following her around. And then he assaulted her and he just kept showing up and acting like nothing had happened. Yeah. She says she almost felt like she thought she made it up at one point, but the physical evidence. The sport sells its female stars as a first starfish, beautiful to behold, but asexual. So she has a lot of shame about this assault because it's like everything she's been taught not to be. She was drinking, just a sexual assault in general. She feels like it's taken the skater out of her. So she then talks about the first person she ever dated was this woman, Ellen, that she names. She met Ellen, as Ashley said, through her sister's friend group. And she's like, I don't know what in me recognized a part of her, but she really taught me not to judge a cover by her book because she was addicted to opioids, but not because she was a junkie, just because she had gotten an injury before. And I am like, I don't know. I think you got to keep detangling the Ellen thing. She does tangle a little bit of people's aversion to Ellen in with some homophobia. And I'm like, I think Ellen might have sucked. Yeah, like Ellen was really against her going to rehab and getting help. Yeah. And also she's like, I loved her because she taught me that you don't have to be judgmental. And I'm like, or did you love her because you recognized like the opioid addict of your father? Yeah. Like her mom and her sister were like, please stop dating Ellen. It's just this idea that like not everyone who uses drugs is a junkie. I'm like, I actually think you've missed the point of destigmatizing like the idea that there's good junkies and bad junkies. <laughs> She's like, she was just addicted to drugs because of an unfortunate circumstance compounded with trauma, as opposed to those crack addicts on the street <laughs> who are bad people. <laughs> not every girl with her tits out is a slut, only some of them. And being a slut is bad, but not all slutty looking girls are sinful. <laughs> God, She's getting there. She's working on it. I love this. And not every unhoused person is a dangerous schizophrenic. <laughs> Gracie, she's almost there. Some of those people are just happily living on the streets. The figure skating organization finds out she's gay, she's bisexual, and they're like, is it true? And she's like, yeah, of course it is. And they're like, but is it true? <laughs> and she's like, yeah. And they're like, but if somebody were to ask you, would you say that it's true? And they're like, could you not? And she's like, no, I can't not. They're like, okay, we'll just make sure nobody asks you then. Dude, I actually looked at her Instagram the other day, and I don't think she was out as bisexual at the time, but she did go to Pride and she had like an American flag that had rainbow stripes on it. And the amount of comments on it that were like, I understand you supporting those people, but could you not do it with our flag? I was like, wait, <laughs> okay. 
I do feel bad for her that like the people who do like live and die by the vibe of an American figure skater are people who are going to be like, wait, you're what? Also, she was saying the fact that there's been queer figure skaters before, but they can't come out. Whereas in other sports, it is more acceptable to be a lesbian or a gay man. She talks a lot about the heteronormativity of figure skating, where it is like a feminine sport. So the girls are straight and the boys are gay. Yeah. I was unable to move on or make any progress because I had not shifted out of survival mode. My depression made any kind of movement effortful, and the less active I was, the more depressed I became. So she's in Detroit, binge eating, and not really leaving her house. She puts on about 50 pounds. It's noticeable that she's not doing great. She doesn't brush her hair or her teeth. I began entertaining thoughts of ending my life, and it still didn't register to me that anything could be clinically wrong. I just thought I was worthless, useless, past my inspiration date. Can I say something ironic? Yeah. The problem when you link up so much of your self-worth with like the thing that you're doing is I am like, it is useless. Like no offense, but how useful is a gold medal Olympian? Yeah. When we go to war, what will Tara Lipinski do for us? (laughs) She'll glide. Like in the apocalypse, is Nastia Lukin making food? Like I don't, do you know what I mean? I mean, that's the problem is most of us are completely fucking worthless. Like none of us have use. I mean, some of us do. Who has a cow and knows how to use it? Who knows how to make electricity out of beans? (laughs) hamsters <laughs> at the end of the day the most useful person you know is a hamster <laughs> i made a maglev train in fifth grade i don't think i can make it human safe but i got the ideas <laughs> could i bring that to the revolution <laughs> imagine showing up to the apocalypse and going i'm so fast on skates and being like okay uh, can i say the way the world is going what ice we'll get some later it's going to double back. Snow piercer. Ice age. Exactly. Okay, so Carly comes to visit and kind of just breaks. She's like, you have to figure this out. Like, this isn't good, but I don't know what to do anymore because everyone's sanity has been like my responsibility for too long and you have to just talk to mom. I can't fucking handle it. And I will say, this is their mom's fault. The way that these girls are buckling under the pressure in different ways. I mean, she should not have been alone for six months in an apartment in Detroit not going to the skating rink without like her mother being like, everything okay over there? I guess the question that I have is, where is that older daughter? What older daughter? Can you imagine that there was like another daughter here? There's two girls who are like, our lives were ruined by our mom whose lack of boundaries smothered me to death almost. And there's just another daughter out there who's like, and me. (laughs) I think that if you played Denise Gold Jeopardy against Denise Gold and asked how many daughters she had, you'd win. (laughs) Like, imagine hearing that the mom you've, like, never known was smothering two other bitches to death. You'd be like, really? Well, like you said earlier, I think that the discarded members of these families, like the dad's ex-wife and the mom's ex-daughter, would feel quite vindicated by this book. Imagine your husband leaves you for some slut at a hospital has two daughters, and one of them goes on to be an Olympian. You would want to fucking die. And then imagine five years later, you find out that those daughters hate him, (laughs) that he lost his job at the hospital because he was stealing prescription medication. Hell yeah. And he's cheating on that old slut still. You'd go, victory. So she's still kind of competing, and then she goes to Champs Camp, which is Camp for champs where they kind of get ready for the big competitive season and everyone is like what the fuck is up with gracie she basically went as a cry for help she says and a couple people finally noticed and we're like we're sending you to rehab and so she goes to rehab jen shattered the snow globe i had been trapped in the relief i felt was palpable i'd been seen jen had heard me she had no friends and like she wasn't around her mom she wasn't around her sister like the only thing she had was skating and the fact that skating was like i don't know as long as you're smiling things are fine Yeah, there was nobody in her life that cared about her well-being above her skating potential. So she had planned to sit out of the Grand Prix series and then come back for the Olympics after 45 days in rehab. It was ludicrous for me to think that the Olympics were still on the table, but the lies we tell ourselves to live die hard. To spend like a year just like rotting in your apartment and be like, no, I'm still going to the Olympics. So she ends up going to rehab. She goes to the Meadows, which is... $50,000. And she is like, shout out to the U.S. Figure Skating Consortium for paying for that. I do. Thank you. 
She's like, it didn't even occur to me to ask who was paying. I had this vague idea that I'd check in, meet with a therapist to say that I had, and then leave after a week or two in time to skate in one or two of my assigned competitions to prepare for the Olympics. My denial ran deep. It's also so funny because there are those two parts of her. Like, she's the one that was begging for help. And then she's like, help. Okay, I'll check the box and get out of here. Yeah. She doesn't even know she's depressed at this point. She thinks she just has an eating disorder. And then she gets there and find out that she has severe depression, anxiety, OCD. Later, she finds out she has ADHD and an eating disorder. To me, ADHD is like when you put chives on a meal. <laughs> it's not even a real flavor. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a ubiquitous garnish. <laughs> I recognized my behaviors were not about self-destruction. They were about maintaining an illusion of control. She makes friends at the Meadows and she's like, oh my God, they didn't even know I was a skater. It was so cool. People liked me for me. Who was me? TBD. I understand that in her world of figure skating, which is like the only world she's ever known, she is like a huge super celeb. But like who actually at rehab cared? Why would they care? And also to be like, I had to keep my secret identity hidden in rehab. I'm like, well, you got where the other girls got. It turns out you could have been doing meth your whole life and you would have ended up at the same rehab. So no problem. I think if I was in rehab and I met a champion figure skater, I'd be like, well, let's get our slipperiest socks on and throw down. <laughs> <laughs> let's see which one of us is the champion. They like very specifically are not allowed to have slippy socks. That's like the whole thing about rehab is you get grippy ass socks. It's like why you go. <laughs> so what you're saying is actually like quite literally a death threat. <laughs> let's clear our socks inside out. And slip. <laughs> she like writes a bunch of letters to skating and realizes that's her true addiction. Yeah. So she gets in and she goes, wait, what if my eating disorder isn't triggering my depression? My depression is triggering my eating disorder. And this is where she realizes her eating disorder had kind of like masked the worst problems in her life because she can control her eating, but she couldn't control her parents' divorce, which they're not divorced to this day. Yeah, they're just separate. Slowly, a person emerged in treatment who might have been me if skating hadn't turned me into someone else. A bad bitch who loved wailing on a punching bag in the gym and doing Tai Chi at night. She decides she is done with skating. And listen, I will say there is a version of Gracie, this like bad bitch who vapes. I'm just like, I don't know, man, you're still blonde, so I can't believe you. She gets her septum pierced and gets a tattoo, but she calls it getting tatted. And I'm like, I don't know, man. She gets really into therapy and like learns about herself and then is like trying to win at therapy. She's like, I did a lot of research and I've now figured everything out and my parents. And she is like, it's hard to hit that parenting sweet spot where you're there for them and care, but you're also hands off enough that they can develop their own capabilities. She also isn't done with skating. She like immediately gets back on the ice almost because she decides that actually the healthiest thing is to break up with skating on her own terms. Could I be a figure skater without jeopardizing my mental and physical health? The road to answering that question has been difficult and strewn with some powerful and painful lessons. So she's back on the ice. Slowly but surely, they persuaded me that my talent wasn't like a pair of sunglasses left behind on an airplane and lost forever. My muscle memory still contained all that I needed to succeed. So she has to build up from zero again. And she's like, it's really important to me to be able to make this comeback because I'll be the first skater who's ever come back from a mental injury, not a physical one. But I'm not going to lie. There's nothing more humbling than being one of the worst girls at the rink, especially when you used to be the best. I read somewhere that less than 6% of all skaters had mastered a double axle. When you start talking about triple axles, the number shrinks to 1% or 2%. For me to expect to land every triple cleanly 100% of the time was ridiculous. I was surrounded by people who wouldn't allow me to lose sight of how cool it was that I was doing any of this stuff again. So she gets a new team, this guy Vincent from Paris, Pavel, Pasha, and Alex. A new Alex. And she is like, these guys saved me. They were coaching me for free because they believed in me and they were the first people who like had my back sincerely and cared about me as a person and like helped me push through and really honed in on where is that line of pushing your body to get stronger, but not pushing your body to the brink of death. Fresh out of rehab, she sparks a friendship with a guy named John Coughlin. John was a two-time U.S. National Pairs champion from Kansas City, Missouri. She was surprised to hear from him. He's like, things are looking bad for you, but let's do this like motivational speaking series to kind of help you out of your funk. So it's kind of like an ice skating seminar where people get to meet her. It's called Road to Gold. So it seems like her thing and they do it together. And I guess he is like assisting her training these little kids. And he's like, it's so important for you to understand how many fans you have out there. And I know you need the money. And they become best friends. And she's like, he's my best friend in the world. We're talking all the time. He's there for me. He's sending me little gifts. She says he's the love of her life. They might have gotten married someday. And then he gets 
accused of sexual assault by multiple people in the team. This is right after the Larry Nazar case went public, where it was clear that the U.S. gymnastics team failed the girls of the team for years and hundreds of young gymnasts had been assaulted by this guy and covered it up. And so in response, the Ice Skating Federation is trying to like go above and beyond to say it answers claims of sexual misconduct. And so he is being investigated after four people came forward with claims of sexual abuse against him. And she's like, but how could that be true if he's my best friend? And then she has this weird thing where she's like, she's like, my case was never really examined. So maybe they are just like pick them at random and blame people. And she's like, it's not even fair because he was accused, but he wasn't found guilty. He wasn't found guilty because he died by suicide before the case could be investigated. So it's kind of a crazy chapter where she's trying to like rectify these two things where she's like, on the one hand, he was my best friend in the world and I loved him. But on the other hand, what if he did do all those things? What does that mean about me that like I love a bad person? And she's like, but what if he was completely innocent? And she's like, all he cared about was his character. And now his character was forever marred. Even if he'd been found innocent, the headlines would never be erased. And it's just like, oh, no. I mean, I kind of thought it was interesting, like watching somebody grapple with the two sides of that situation. However, I, we looked into it because she was like, I don't know. I guess we'll never know what happened. Four different women all had the same story. And then after he died... In support of those women, Ashley Wagner came out and was like, he assaulted me and I never said anything because I knew nothing would come of it. But like, I stand with the women who have accused him because I experienced it too. Ashley Wagner. Her rival. Her not rival, just the person she competed with most often in her life who she did not like. (laughs) It was interesting, but I really did not enjoy watching her grapple with the fact that he might have been innocent. She wants to believe him to be innocent. But meanwhile, she had had that chapter previously about how she had had such a hard time coming forward because she didn't think she'd be believed. It would be a he said, she said situation. She didn't feel like she had enough proof to come forward and she didn't think skating would take it seriously. So now to watch skating take it seriously and her be like, but did they really know what they were talking about? It's like, yes, I don't know. I don't know for sure if John was innocent or not. It's a lose-lose either way. If he was guilty, it means I fell in love with a sexual predator. What would that make me? His respectability beard? She's like, he never did anything bad to me. I had a really hard time with this chapter. (laughs) It just is interesting because she's like, yeah, I don't know. He was just some guy I didn't know who found me at my lowest point and built a business with me. (laughs) So he must have been a good guy. She's like, he had no ulterior motives except for that he made 50% of the profit. And at times she wanted to like quit. And he was like very insistent that she stay in ice skating, doing this program with him. And she's like, I don't know. His agent was so nice to me too. Like, yeah, the agent who made 10% of the business you built with him where you were the face and star. Yeah. I mean, he's for sure a bad guy. It's just like sad to watch her a couple chapters after be like, how is it that people get away with this? Anyway, this charming guy who some girls accused, but he was so nice and charming. So who could accuse him? So then she gets into, it's a fine line, the gossamer thread between character building behaviors and soul crushing ones. Moments of discomfort are a good up to a point, but where do you draw the line as an athlete, a parent, or a coach? It's a delicate balancing act between pushing myself like I did before when I'd repeat a failed jump over and over, sometimes as much to punish myself as to get it right, and pulling back because I was veering into mentally unhealthy territory. So the thing is, when she's back in competition, she's still placing nationally. Yeah. But she's not on the podium. She's not the top of the field for sure. And so it's viewed as this huge failure. So then she spends this time like she's getting back and she wants to get back into the 2018 Olympics. And she's competing as hard as she can. And it's like one of those things where she may have to go back to kind of the bottom and win at regionals, win at sectionals, win at nationals, instead of just skipping ahead. Every time she tries to skip ahead, she kind of loses and falls on her butt. So she is like a top 10 ice skater in America, but you need to be like top six. Yeah. Then her coach vanishes. Yeah. (laughs) Her coach, Vincent. Like out of everybody's life. He just left the house he shared one day and left a note saying, can you return the car I had leased? Nobody saw or heard from him again. Yeah. And so she has a couple of really like great comeback efforts where she places and she just connects to the music. I like She never actually wins a medal again. Maybe she wins one more bronze. But she has a couple of performances where she fucking nails it. And everyone's just really moved by her performance. And she's the oldest person out there. At like 23, maybe. And she keeps feeling skating's for adults too. And I'm like, where are the adults? You're 23. (laughs) Then she meets a guy that she has a crush on in the ice capades or something. Yeah, his name is James. He's six years younger than her. She's 25. He's 19. But they love each other. She spends like six months flirting with him before he realizes. And then they start dating. 
And then she's kind of killing her comeback. Like she's not there yet, but people had completely counted her out. And now they're like, wait a minute, who is she? So she has one last incredible performance after suffering through COVID. She doesn't have COVID, but COVID was really hard on her. Yeah. <laughs> Personally. <laughs> because she was like on her comeback game and then COVID hit. And so now everything's like thrown off. But so she has this competition. There's a short and then a long program and she crushes her short program. And she comes in third overall and everybody's like, oh my God, she might go back to the Olympics this year. And then it gets in her head so bad. And then when she goes out for her long program, there's an ad for Noom and she just like falls on her butt. But she ends up coming in sixth, and she's like, that's pretty good for somebody that everyone doubted. I mean, sixth is really high when you think about the world. Mm -hmm. And then she talks about the fact that everybody in Russia has been given drugs and all the doping scandals and it's come out way worse in recent years. But she's like, looking back, I don't know, all those girls I was up against were probably on drugs and that's not fair. Yeah, I mean, it's not. It sucks. Then we get into a chapter about a breast reduction. When she gained and then lost a lot of weight, her boobs stayed really big and she was strapping them down in order to skate well in like binders. Where you can barely breathe. Yeah. Like it's not recommended that you exercise in them, let it's alone do. It's specifically recommended that you don't. And her sister used them once for hockey and she couldn't even get to the rink. She's like, how are you breathing in this? And she's like, I don't know. I just like am in pain all the time. So she finally gets a breast reduction and she doesn't tell anybody and she's scared of being judged. And she's like, it's not fair that if you want to get your breast reduced, everybody questions you. I guess there are a lot of like sweeping things, especially in the second half of this book when it's a lot less like thought through and realized where she's like, this as a general concept is like unfair to the world. And it's like, I, I think it was like a hard thing in your life. I guess I also do think it's quite reasonable to ask her why she wants to undergo surgery when she's somebody who has struggled with body dysmorphia and she is somebody who has struggled with an eating disorder. And when she's at the end of her skating career, she's like, also, it made it really hard for me to do spins because my center of gravity and I was less aerodynamic. But that's not why I was doing it. And it's like, okay, I don't fully believe you. I guess I am like, as somebody who went to rehab because ice skating fucked your body up so bad, I think it's reasonable to say, are you sure you want to go under the knife and get surgery to make your body better for ice skating? Because she's like, if I wanted to get a nose job to help me breathe better, nobody would bat an eye. But I want to get my boobs reduced so that I can spin faster. And everybody's like, oh, that's an elective surgery. And I'm like, well, it is. Yeah. <laughs> being able to breathe and being an Olympian are different things. Yeah. She says this crazy thing where she's like, I finally found a doctor. And at first he was going to try and talk me out of it. But then he did a complete 180 after examining my narrow rib cage and my, quote, snoopy nosed shaped breasts resting low on my frame as if they had been drawn on my body by the cartoonist Charles Schultz. I'm sorry, a doctor said that a to you? A doctor said, look at those Snoopy-ass boobies. <laughs> he said, I was going to tell you to keep them, but now that I see they're so low and dog-like, woof, woof. <laughs> <laughs> I do this surgery for peanuts. <laughs> um, she's very happy with them. And then when she gets them off, her boyfriend's like, why don't you try to go back to the Olympics with your new body? And I'm like, let this girl breathe, please. So now she's like competing again, kind of. She also runs into her dad in New York. He like comes to see her at this event and her agent is like, who's that guy? And she's like, my dad. She had been ignoring him for a year and she goes out to dinner with him and was like, he's an Uber driver now. And he's like, you should be really proud of me for getting off my butt and not just sitting in a depression. And she's like, is that an attack on me? I'm like, I don't know. You almost went back to the Olympics. I wouldn't say you're somebody who necessarily sat on your butt. Yeah, I will say her entire like arc of quote unquote breakdown was like pretty short comparatively. It's very Britney Spears-esque. Yeah. When you look at it, you're like, okay, so we're talking about two bad months. Yeah. I've had two bad months and called it a good day. <laughs> but she was like, at the end of the day, I don't think my dad even misses me. He misses the reflection of himself and having a daughter who's Gracie Gold. That's fair. Because what's more validating to his ego than seeing himself reflected in his famous and special daughter? So she still doesn't talk to him. And meanwhile, her boyfriend's dad is dying. And he's like, don't you think you're going to regret it if your dad dies and you're not speaking? And she goes, nope. She goes, I think I'd regret it if I had a dad like yours. Man, Carly is still getting kicked. Her mom's nursing again. Her mom's a nurse because Gracie just doesn't make enough money to support the whole family. If I had been able to keep my shit together through the 2018 Olympics, I probably would have been able to support us. So Carly's still getting her ass kicked by the family. At one point, she talks about how she was supposed to go to California to be with Carly for their birthday in August. She doesn't say in August, but their birthday is in August. Remember that. And then she gets invited to Champs Camp again. And so she cancels. And she says Carly was like inconsolable. And so then she ends up doing like a makeup trip for Christmas. 
And I am like, wait a second, you were supposed to spend your joint birthday with your joint sister and you couldn't make it in August. So you were like, I'll be there in December. Like you couldn't go at the end of August or maybe how long is Champs Camp? Anyway, she has this final performance in the 2022-2023 season where she like nails it and she does the best performance out of everybody out there and she's so old. And even Tara Lipinski is like incredible and everybody's brought to fucking tears. People are out of their seats, a standing ovation. And she says, someone took a photo of me when I was happy on the ice and I look so beautiful when I'm happy. And she's just kind of like, all right, that's a good place to leave it. I left California feeling like I had nothing left to prove, but I still had a lot to give. And I love that sentence actually. Yeah. I think that's like a really great mind framing sentence. Yeah. She's also like been having injuries this whole time. She had like a hip situation and a foot and a knee. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. She's in this place where like when she is skating well, she's happy. She doesn't need to like go to the Olympics again, maybe. So she comes back and she gets involved with the Olympics. There's finally a female CEO and they're trying to make it a safer place for the women. And she's doing coaching and she's talking to young girls and she's helping people. Something I can't emphasize enough since I was guilty of this kind of martyr complex thinking, you don't get any medals for suffering in silence the longest. She's now all about like speaking out and raising awareness and helping young women. And she loves coaching. In the end, it was me, not my parents or Carly, who was never satisfied, who kept pushing, who lost sight of reality and turned skating into the Hunger Games. No one gets to the top in anything, schoolwork, sports, without sacrifices that might look a little excessive from the outside, sometimes even from the inside. It gets too intense. And so people are shocked that she's becoming a coach. At first, she just does it for a paycheck because post rehab, she needed to make money. And then she loves it. She like loves it. She loves that she has experience, personal experience to be able to lend to these young skaters. Anyway, so she gets a lot of validation and pride from teaching and helping kids overcome and view skating as like a fun an exciting thing that they can improve at and they can work to get better at, but they shouldn't like lose themselves in. Mm -hmm. Anyway, overall, I really liked it a lot, actually. Me too. I think it could have been edited slightly. You could tell where there's like eight chapters where they're like, we don't know what to do with these stories. So stick them at the end. I feel like there were a handful of things, especially those chapters where she had a point to make and she was almost writing them like in argument with the press. Mm hmm. And they could have just been a lot shorter and she could have just made a point. She didn't need to do like a whole lead up of like history states that skating must be viewed as. That's a problem that a lot of memoirists get trapped in is the fighting for their lives against every single headline. Yeah. Whereas like how important was that? Like it, there might have just been a tweet. Yeah. She loves Twitter. She is very deep in social media. But it was really great. It's very interesting. I mean, the thing about these incredible athletes are they do just have a different psyche. Yeah. But I am like, oh, you guys are little freaks in there. It's always interesting to get a glimpse into that shit. Yeah, it's scary. It's so interesting to be like, well, couldn't be me. I'm like, if I'm this hard on myself when I do literally nothing, how hard would it be if I had a talent? <laughs> Please. She's the most self-hated. I know. I could never be as self-hating as an Olympian. How fertile is this dirt? I would say... 3.8. I went 4.25. Okay. I actually really, really liked it. Especially of all the athletes' memoirs we've read, I've really, I really, really liked it. Yeah. And how many drinks would you like to have? How many warm teenies with the Gracie Gold? I'm going to be honest. Zero, because that's my answer. Zero. There is something about her. I simply was like, we're built different. <laughs> I don't know that we'd have anything to talk about. I think she's too close in age. I'm going to sit there and be like, yeah, I don't know. I did my best. It was fine. Or like, I'm not even, I'll be like, I don't know. I gave it a, a shot. It came out okay. And she'd be like, what do you mean you gave it a shot and it came out okay? Don't you want to kill yourself? And I'd be like, should I? <laughs> should I want to kill myself? Yeah, I just don't think we'd have anything in common. And I also think that like, there is like a little bit of wannabe coolness to her that I think I'd really dislike. The way she keeps on saying sat for a tat. I'm like, just say got a tattoo. <laughs> well, she said it twice. I think three. Okay, well. She should die. <laughs> it's just one of those things where I'm like, I just don't think we'd have a lot in common personally. Like, she thinks the coolest thing about her is that she kept on being like, my diet of coffee and cigarettes. I'm like, no, there's no way that's true. I think you've had a cigarette. <laughs> she says she never leaves house without the vape. She loves her vape. I don't like that about her. <laughs> All right, you guys. But what do we like? We love our five-star 